Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Simon Foster. I'm a solar physicist at Imperial College in London. I'm also a member of the Imperial Space Lab. My research looks at changes in the sun and how they could impact the Earth. Now, today's talk, I'm going to talk about the sun. And it's called Our Living Sun because, believe it or not, our sun hasn't always been here. It was born, it will actually live a varied and changing life and one day it will actually die and it's these changes that is it's just like a human being in this way it's these changes that mark its life and um we're going to look at these different changes and we're about halfway through its life at the moment so let me get started so here we are now this here is a picture of the sun but it's actually taken in x-rays so the sun doesn't just emit visible light it emits different frequencies of light all the way from radio and microwaves all the way up to x-rays and gamma rays and looking at the sun through different uh, frequencies through different types of light we can see different features and that's really important for solar physicists like myself now the sun hasn't always been here, okay? Before the sun in this region of space, uh, there was other stars. There was at least two, possibly three other stars. And these were first generation stars. These were the first stars created after the Big Bang. Now, these stars were huge and they burnt through their fuel really, really quickly. And what happened was because they were so huge, they exploded in something you may have heard of it called a supernova. And one of these stars would have exploded and ripped apart the other stars nearby. Now, in doing so, it scattered debris over well, wow, hundreds of light years. OK, all this debris would have been scattered out there. Now, over millions of years, this debris would have started to come together. It would have started to coalesce. Now, at the center, hydrogen and helium would have started to come together slowly it would have gathered more and more under its own gravity collecting more and more material in until eventually the sun was born now in the material around it you would have got the debris the leftover material and it's a bit like a builder's yard whenever you get a building and you made a house or anything there's always material left over and it was a bit like this with the sun there was material left over from these other stars and they formed the planets now um it's a bit like if you rub your hands together you know they get warmer and warmer and warmer these planets these early planets these early world would have been really hot and lava filled okay and the sun would have been really hot just from the friction now what would eventually happen is that material the hydrogen and the helium at the center of the solar system this new solar system would have got hotter and hotter and denser and denser and denser and eventually it would have ignited and it was a bit like a uh, baby letting out a scream it would have let out a colossal roar an explosion and it would have affected all this dust and debris and early planets around it now i'm going to ask you a question is it easier to blow a, a rock or a piece of dust just think about that Well, it's easier if I had a rock here and a piece of dust here. It's easier to blow the piece of dust. And that's actually pretty similar to what happened in the solar system. So you had all this leftover debris. And when the sun kind of roared into life, all the light material would have got blown further out. And all the rocky, heavy material would have stayed close to the sun. And this is why we have the rocky planets close to the sun uh, mercury venus earth mars and then you have the gas giants further out jupiter saturn okay so that's how the sun and the solar system was born this is what it looks like now okay so this is our sun you can see there's lots of different features on it there's some kind of uh, 
what we call like flares or prominences coming out of the edge there was bright parts dark parts i should point out please do not look directly at the sun this is taken for a special telescope in space but there are lots of features on its surface however what's powering the sun so if we look at this it's actually hydrogen it's a type of nuclear um, energy called nuclear fusion now you may have heard nuclear power okay there's two different types there's nuclear fusion and nuclear fission now fission is big it's like uh, elements such as uranium and plutonium big heavy elements that are too big to hold themselves together and they break apart into smaller elements and let out a small amount of energy now the opposite is true here this is called nuclear fusion and fusion fuse if you fuse something together is you stick something together okay so here in nuclear fusion what you're starting with is four hydrogen atoms okay or nuclei protons effectively and you're squashing them together okay and as you squash them together four protons squash together and they become a helium nucleus and that's two protons and two neutrons bizarrely two of the protons turn into neutrons and that, that i find that absolutely amazing now here's a simplified version okay you've got four protons going in squashed together boom out comes uh helium and a small amount of energy is also released but how do we know this well it's thanks to uh this chap here do any of you can any of you figure out who this is from just this picture have a look and see if you can figure it out okay some of you okay one or two of you may have got this let's move on I suspect quite a few of you got it now if you look at the eyes and I suspect you all know who it is now this is Albert Einstein and he had his famous equation E equals MC squared. Now, what does this mean? Well, actually, what it means is, is the energy and mass, matter, the stuff that you're made of and everything is made of, is interchangeable. You can turn energy into mass, and mass into energy. It's mind-blowing. And because it's E equals MC squared, now the C stands for uh, the speed of light, and that's squared, okay? Now, the speed of light's a big number anyway, and squaring it you get an absolutely huge number and what this means is from just a small amount of mass you can generate a huge amount of energy so in the Sun uh, 600 million tons of hydrogen is fused every second okay now 0.7 percent of that just disappears it gets turned straight into energy and that's because a neutron is ever so slightly lighter than a proton okay so bizarrely four million tons of hydrogen four million tons is just disappearing every second it's becoming energy and to give you an idea how much energy that's releasing uh, that's equivalent in if you were to fuse that much to about 90 billion tons of TNT that's how much energy the Sun our star is releasing every second now why is that so important to uh, us down here on earth well imagine you had a snowflake in your hand just put that snowflake out imagine you've got a tiny tiny snowflake in your hand now that's made of water H2O if you took the hydrogen from that snowflake and fused it you would generate your entire lifetime's worth of energy. That's all the energy you need for your entire life from the hydrogen contained in just one snowflake. This is why everyone is so desperate to get hold of nuclear fusion. This is why it's such a, a, a technology and energy source that everyone's so desperate to, uh, to discover or be able to make possible here on Earth. But actually, how do we know that the sun's made of hydrogen and helium? We can't go there. What we can do is look at the light so you know uh, just by looking at a rainbow the white light can be split into the colors of the rainbow um, all the way from red at one end to uh, yeah, violet the other I was trying to remember uh, Richard of York gave battle in, rain, in vain red orange yellow green blue indigo violet 
okay but actually if you were to split um, white light from the Sun up using a prism you will actually see that it isn't pure okay there's little lines in it and these lines are the fingerprints the identifiers of the elements inside the Sun so actually you may be familiar with this chap this is Isaac Newton and he was obsessed with looking at prisms and how actually what the makeup of light was okay and so he was the first person not to split light with a prism but recombine that split light back into white light so he knew they were interchangeable now why does this happen why uh, art does uh, is are there these kind of black lines these fingerprints in the light well it's down to the atomic nature of uh, atoms of elements okay so you may be familiar with the this the structure of the atom and this is it here you've got the positive nucleus where the protons and neutrons are and orbiting around it in shells you've got electrons okay so what I've got a picture of here is uh, hydrogen one proton one electron orbiting around and you've got here the periodic table okay and the periodic table just basically tells you how many protons and electrons and neutrons by the mass are in each element now going through here are the kind of structures of some of the basic elements we've got hydrogen helium's got two electrons lithium's got three beryllium's got four and it's these electrons orbiting around that actually give elements i suppose the easiest way to say is their fingerprint and every element in the periodic table every element here has got its own unique fingerprint okay and it's this is how we identify elements because if we shine uh, if we pass electricity energy through uh, a gas of hydrogen actually these electrons get pushed up they get like much like if you throw a ball up they go up to a higher energy shell then fall back down and when they fall back down they give off a photon of light of energy and it's at very specific frequencies okay depending on the element depending on the electron shells okay and this is their fingerprint so the one I've got here is this is the fingerprint of hydrogen pass electricity through hydrogen gas and you'll get these four different colors out okay and in the UK I don't know if it, in other countries but we used to have what's called sodium street lights our lights actually had sodium gas in when you passed electricity through it they would give off orange because actually orange is orangey yellow was the predominant line in sodium so this is what street lights in the UK all used to look like they've changed a bit now but when I was a kid all street lights look like this and to give you an idea this is what I find really interesting here is a gherkin now a gherkin is a pickle okay in the UK and it's made it's got a salt in it sodium and chlorine so much salt in fact that if you pass electricity through it and hopefully this is going to happen when electricity oh now don't do this at home you've basically these people have taken a gherkin a pickle put two nails into it and connected that up to electricity supply please don't do that but when you pass electricity for it because it's so sodium that sodium the electrons get excited in it go up fall back down and give off photons of light and you can see the orange there now what's also interesting is that if you pass uh, normal photon just pure light through an element of a particular gas not it won't emit but it will absorb in the same frequencies as it, as it emits at okay so if you try and pulse energy through a gas of a particular element those fingerprints those frequencies where it, it's sensitive at it will actually absorb lighting so you can see here in this picture here at the top here I've got it here this is where hydrogen absorbs and it absorbs in the same frequency it emits in so you can see this when you pass pure white light photons through a gas say hydrogen it will actually block the certain fingerprints and this is how we use it to identify it so in the Sun absorbs those frequencies in its fingerprint and so when it gets to come out and it hits towards the earth actually these fingerprints are there there are black lines where it's absorbed the kind of frequencies of hydrogen and helium and this is what it looks like hydrogen looks like this 
Helium's on the right hand side, and you can see it's slightly more complex. Now, when we look at the sun, you can see it's, it, it, there are um, absorption frequencies, lots of them. You can see them here. And when people first looked at this, actually, they thought that actually there must be a mysterious element in the sun that was unique to the sun. Okay, they knew about hydrogen because hydrogen you could blow it up. Chemistry is really about blowing things up. But there was something there that they didn't know, and it was helium. Helium's a noble gas, it doesn't react with anything. So they thought that helium was a special gas that was only found on the sun, and I believe they called it chromospherium because they thought it existed in the corona of the sun. Okay, so that's actually where, bizarrely, helium was actually discovered on the sun, not on Earth first. Now we can actually use this as well to look at other stars and other planets because actually when, say you have a star and its light passes through the gas of a, of a planet that goes in front between the Earth and the star, actually you can see what fingerprints, what elements are present in its gas. And this is how we know when we talk about exoplanets, planets orbiting around other stars, this is how we know what they're made of. So this is the structure of the sun, okay? So we've got the core, this is the center where the fusion happens. Then around it, you've got what's called the radiative zone, and this is where the material passes straight out, pushes straight out. And then you've got something called the convection zone. Now you may have heard about convection on Earth. Convection is where you have hot material rising, cold material falling, hot material rising, cold material falling. And then this leads to the very edge of something called the photosphere. And this is the visible surface, and this is what I'm interested in. And above you get, you get the chromosphere and the corona, which you can only really see in eclipses. Now, how do we actually see deep down into the sun? Well, we use something called uh, helioseismology or seismology. You may have heard of this from earthquakes. Well, the sun kind of has waves traveling across it, actually. And the sun's surface can be thought of as a bit like a bowl of tomato soup. And this is actually what me and my old PhD supervisor used to call the surface of the sun. We called it the tomato soup because you may know about convection, hot material rises, cold material falls, hot rises, falls, rises, falls, rises, falls. Okay, and if we look at the surface of the sun, so this here is a satellite looking at the sun. Okay, and it's focused really, really tightly in. And if I press on that, can you see, hopefully, you should be able to see there, there are dark patches and bright patches, hot material rising in the bright patches, cooling down and falls back down. So you get, they're called cells. Okay, material. And this, if I've got it at the bottom, this is me recording here, uh, me making some tomato soup, actually spaghetti sauce. And you can see it's exactly the same. You've got the, uh, I'll try and get it over here, hot material rising here, it's falling around it. Okay, so you've got hot material rising on the sun, and then it's falling, just like in a bowl of tomato soup. Now, on top of this tomato soup, we've got the things that I really love, and these are called sunspots. And these are big, dark, black patches on the sun's surface. And this is this is one here taken in 2007. Okay, now the tomato soup bubbling away is about 5,700 degrees Kelvin, but a sunspot is only 4,000 Kelvin, okay? It's nearly 2,000 degrees colder and the surrounding area. And if we have a look, if we have a close up at a uh, sunspot, you can see here, you can see the tomato soup bubbling away here. And this is a sunspot here, big, cold, dark black patch. And actually what's really interesting is that an average size sunspot is about the size of the earth and they appear in pairs. Okay, so you usually have them as a pair. Uh, which you can see here. And I think it looks a bit like, uh, have you ever seen the sunflowers by Van Gogh? It looks a bit like that to me. I think this is a beautiful image. By the way, this is me. I've put superimposed this picture of the sun on. 
okay so this isn't uh, the earth isn't really there okay but going back to the first picture I showed you and the uh, picture here of the uh, in x-rays you can see that these are actually these are what we call magnetic field line now the Sun's a giant magnet like the earth it has a north and a south pole but over the solar what we call cycle or solar cycle it breaks down and actually these magnetic loops pop out in places where they shouldn't. They no longer appear at the North and South Pole. They appear all over the sun, surface of the sun. And this is where you get the sunspots. So this is where you get them in pairs because you've got the loop coming in and the loop going back into the sun. Okay. And what's really interesting is this is why you get sunspots because you may know about uh, from uh, electro, uh, electromagnetics. Uh, uh, God. So uh, if you have a moving charge, it will produce a magnetic field and a magnetic field will deflect a moving charge. OK, so the sun's actually a charged gas. It's what we call a plasma. OK, and it's a big soup of charged material. OK, and obviously, therefore, if you have a big magnetic field near it, it's going to move some of that material around. So what's happening in the sunspot is where you have these really strong concentrated magnetic fields it pushes the material out of the way and it cools in these areas and this is why sunspots appear cooler to give you an idea I've got an old TV here okay this is an old cathode ray tube TV and what I've got here is a magnet so a cathode ray tube uses electrons to hit the screen and the electrons are charged particles and they're moving but if I introduce a magnetic field where there shouldn't be one these electrons don't hit the screen where they should they hit the screen where they shouldn't and you suddenly get these strange patterns and this is effectively what's happening on the surface of the Sun you get materials getting pushed away from where it should be to where it isn't and you get cooling in those areas now sunspots aren't new they've been around for thousands of years well millions of years probably and the first drawing of the Sun was taken in 1128 through a forest fire in Britain by a monk called John of Worcester and you can see it here it must have been absolutely huge and if you put it side by side with a picture taken from a satellite as I say you can see just how big that sunspot must have been now Galileo also made drawings of sunspots he uh, actually pointed his telescope at the Sun and then projected the image down to onto a huge table because obviously if you look for it uh, the sun through your eye you can really do yourself damage so he actually projected it onto a table and would draw the sunspots now what's really interesting is that it's possible hopefully I'm gonna do this here to actually ah come on ah brilliant it's possible to animate Galileo's uh, observations of the sun which I've got on the left here and um, look at them with modern satellite observations which you can see here and can you see they're behaving the same now this was about 300 years ago no 400 years ago actually the Galileo was doing this was, this was in 1613 and 1614 so it was over 400 years ago so we know for 400 years sunspots are behaving exactly the same and their numbers go up and down in what we call the solar cycle okay and there was a period called the Maunder minimum which you can see here when they completely disappeared from the sun's surface we don't know why really interesting but when that happened the earth got really really cold there was a mini ice age and in London the Thames the River Thames would freeze over from November through to February so much so that people were able to live on it okay they held fairs on it there was horse races bonkers so this doesn't quite make sense though because if sunspots are cold and when you have fewer of them the Sun gets colder what's going on and this is actually what my supervisor first said to me he said do you expect the Sun to get hotter or colder when there's um, fewer sunspots and I thought well sunspots are cold so when there's fewer of them the Sun should be hotter it's actually the opposite when there's more sunspots the Sun gets hotter hotter and this is peculiar now if we take a closer look at the sunspot here is the sunspot and as it travels across the surface of the Sun you can see the energy decreases it dips so what's going on 
Well, actually, there's something else. And there's something little bright features on the surface of the sun called faculae, and they outweigh the sunspots, okay? It, so even though they're very tiny and small, they outweigh the number of sunspots by about 10 to 1. So when you have more sunspots, you have more of these faculae, these torches, and weirdly, the sun gets brighter. Here you can see a faculae going across the surface of the sun, and as you can see here, the energy goes up. So looking at this picture here with a, with a filter on our camera, you can see that actually the sunspots are dark, but these faculae, these torches, are brighter, and they outweigh so weirdly, when there's more sunspots, there's more faculae and the energy goes up. And it is a good image of, you've got faculae in red. These are the warming of these bright little bits. And in blue, you've got the darkening. And actually, if you add them together, you see that over the solar cycles, you get more sunspots, then less sun's energy will increase when there's more sunspots, decrease when there's less. And actually, the sun's energy output is quite easy to calculate. So easy to calculate, I can do it. And it's a very simple equation. And it tells us that solar irradiance, which is the sun's energy output, is a mixture, is a, is a combination of the quiet sun, which is the tomato soup bubbling away, sunspot index, a photometric sunspot index, which is simply the effect of sunspots, and the brightening of these faculae. Okay. And adding this together, we get this lovely image here. This is from a satellite, so this goes back till 1978. We can actually say it's been, it's gone up and down, up and down, up and down, but there's been very little difference in the past 40 years. However, if we model further back in time, this is what we see, and we see that actually, in the past 300 years, the sun's energy has slowly gone up. Its energy output has got hotter and hotter. And this actually has impacted upon the Earth's climate. The Earth would be slightly warmer because the sun's got slightly more hotter, I suppose. However, the effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is uh, making this even worse. It's amplifying this effect. So what other factors are also on the sun? Well, there's these lovely things called solar flares. Now, here I've got a picture of one of these loops, these big magnetic field lines. And you can imagine their magnetic loops are a bit like rubber bands, okay? And what happens with a rubber band when you stretch it too much? It can snap. This is what we're going to see here, hopefully. So out the limb here, boom. This is what happens when you get a solar flare. Okay. These rubber bands are there. Occasionally they snap and they release tons of energy. It's called a coronal mass ejection. A lot of people use the word solar flare. And it launches it out into space. And what's really interesting is that you get more of these when there are more sunspots. So the amount of sunspots go up and down, up and down over what we call a solar cycle, which you can see here again. And when we're up here, more sunspots and more solar flares, less sunspots, less solar flares. Occasionally, one of these can hit the Earth's magnetic field. And what it does is when one of these flares hits the Earth, it, it pushes the magnetic field back and actually breaks it. And as it breaks the magnetic field lines, energy can feed down and it feeds down at the poles the north and the south pole and what we get is is the aurora so we get the aurora borealis at the north pole the aurora australis at the south pole and the different colors tell us different things so uh, red is oxygen green is oxygen blue is nitrogen and ready purple is nitrogen so you've got a green one here so this means that there's a lot is exciting the oxygen in the atmosphere and we're back to talking about those fingerprints again energy being dumped into a gas is making it excited giving off light and what's really interesting is the well, dangerous is that the if these things are actually quite bad for the earth so we've got satellites watching the earth one called lasco is just ever so slightly further ahead and closer to the sun so if a solar flare hits the earth uh, hits his satellite we know 24 hours later that solar flare will hit the earth so this is like an early warning system so what you're seeing here is uh, data from that so you can see here that one went over it and there's a really big one in a second oh by the way oh there it is now it hits the lasco satellite and we know that in 24 hours that will also hit the earth 
okay it's an early warning system so this tells us to be careful for satellites orbiting the earth because they could be damaged or power lines on the earth could also be damaged and there was one actually in 1859 called the carrington storm that was so powerful that it pushed it broke so many magnetic field lines it pushed the aurora from the north and the south pole all the way down to the equator and it could be seen in the caribbean in jamaica and, that, and, and what's really interesting there was a powerful solar storm last year and this is a picture taken from trinidad and uh, this is one of my students uh, his uncle lives in trinidad and this is a picture of the aurora taken in trinidad so there was such a powerful storm it caused the aurora to be seen in trinidad and i've actually seen the aurora in uh, england i've seen it in london and a city called bath in uh, in england I've seen it a couple of times you don't have to travel to the north and south pole so what does this mean for astronauts say if you want to go to the moon or mars what does this mean well on earth we're protected by a magnetic field and actually uh, on the space station the international space station you're also protected by the earth's magnetic field but in space you've got a bit of a problem now when uh the apollo missions went up you can see here they they're in the gray lines okay and the blue sticks are when um solar flares hit the earth now you can see a couple of them got really close now the yellow ones which actually might have hit apollo 9 that's above annual dose so that means you would have got your annual radiation dose in one go the orange ones here means you increase your doubling your or at least doubling your risk of cancer over your lifetime so the one with apollo 13 which you can see here that nearly hit and that would have raised their cancer risk now this one here is severe radiation sickness this is really bad this is where your fingernails fall out your hair will fall out and you, you will be very 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 ill you'll probably survive it but you'll have severe lifelong problems caused by it however if we look at this one here this would have been instantly fatal now people at the time didn't know this okay so they launched themselves and, and didn't know and this is why it's such a problem going back to the moon and on to mars because if you get hit by one of these really really dangerous now finally what's next for the sun we've seen it as a newborn kind of as a teenager it's got spots what's going to happen now as an adult well actually when it runs out of hydrogen fuel it's going to start burning helium and it will get bigger and bigger and it kind of like adults do as all men do we get fatter we get slightly redder and this is what's going to happen to the sun it will get it will become what's called a red giant and it will actually grow at least 10 times possibly 100 times its size and we believe our sun will actually swallow up the earth now after this that will go on for a few billion years as a red giant and then it will run out of fuel completely now unlike bigger stars it won't go supernova it needs to be about eight times bigger than our sun for it to go supernova instead it will just shrink down and it will become a white dwarf it will become a really hot basically ember of a star it won't fuse anymore it could actually become a giant lump of coal of carbon in space and we know carbon under heat and pressure becomes diamonds so our sun eventually could just become a huge and in space but eventually it will get colder and colder and colder smaller and smaller like all of us my nan you could imagine actually i, I say she was a white dwarf because she got white hair and she gets smaller as she got older as we all do and that's what's going to happen to our son So thank you very much for listening. It's been a real pleasure and I believe I will now be around to answer some questions.